church. All right, please stand with us. Go ahead and clap along if you want. We're going to praise the king this morning. I believe in one salvation, one doorway that leads to life. I believe in redemption. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in crucifixion by his blood. Video. Can't you can't beat that, can you? These kids are so cute. 
Uh, well, welcome to St. Clair Christian Church. We're glad that you guys are here this morning to worship with us. Happy Mother's Day to all your moms. Uh, we're glad that you're here and you are so valued and we just appreciate you so much. And uh, I just want you to know that if you haven't gotten a cookie gift, a cookie flower back there, make sure you grab one of those uh, when you leave. Uh, those are gifts for you. Uh, just to show our appreciation to you and uh, just glad that you're here. Thank you for being moms. So you guys do a great job uh, making such an impact on our lives. And happy Mother's Day to you, Mom, if you're watching. So let's let her know. Um, well, we're glad you're here. And we're not just going to be talking about moms this morning, not just, just our moms, but all women. Uh, we want to talk about that, how God values women uh, this morning and take advantage of Mom's Day to talk about that. Um, but God values women. Um, but before we get into that part of the message, the servers are going to get up. They're going to pass out the offering trays this morning. We're going to continue our worship this morning by collecting our tithes and offerings. Uh, God challenges us to give our tithe, to trust him in that 10%, uh, and to show our trust in him and that he is God of our lives. If you can't prepare to do that, uh, drop that in the tray. Uh, you aren't prepared right now, and you, you're writing your check out now. You can deposit it in the box by the door as you leave. Or you can give online, and the program is a place you can scan the QR code or scan the QR code here. If you're online, uh, you can scan the QR code there uh, if you came prepared to give. And if you're new and this is your first time here at St. Clair Christian, we would love to know more about you, get to know you more. And if you could fill out one of the Connect cards that are in the chair in front of you, that would be awesome. And uh, just send you. We're going to have uh, this coming Thursday night. At 6 o'clock, if you're new and you want to know more about us as a church, we're going to have a, a first-time dinner. It's called Starting Point. I uh, would love for you to come be a part of that. It's free. You don't have to bring anything. Just come. Bring yourself. We'll have child care if you have kids. Um, but come. Uh, get to know me. Get to know the elders and the other staff here at the church. And get an opportunity to give you an opportunity to get to know us better. Find out what we believe, where we're going as a church. Um, and you can ask any of those questions, and then for us to get to know you as well. So if you're interested in being here for that, uh, uh, picture there, or you can go to the Church Center app if you've downloaded that to sign up as well. I uh, would love for you to be a part of that. And then the, the last thing is, is Devin is having an event for the kids. It's called Schools Out, Games Out. There's a, a card back there at the Get Connected table. It's going to be May 24th from 4 to 6 after school is done. Uh, her and John are going to be up here. If you're from kin your kids are in kindergarten to junior high, uh, bring them up here. Come hang out. They're going to play games, have a good time together, uh, have pizza, um, and then there's going to play a big game of hide and seek at the end. So uh, if you want to take advantage of that for your kids, bring them up here on uh, Friday, the 24th, 4 to 6 p.m. I think that's a Friday. Um, and then you can, if you want to volunteer and help out with that, you can sign up at the Get Connected table in the back as well. Uh, Devin can use, always use the help. So it's an opportunity for you to serve and, and to be a part of the kids and help with that. So please sign up, please be involved, please bring your kids to be a part of that. All right, so I'm going to jump in. I'm going to read from John chapter 2, and we're going to start there. It says this, on the third day, a wedding took place in, at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. And nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Those are pretty big, right? Big jugs, yeah. And uh, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water so, that, so they filled them to the brim, to the top. Then he told them, now draw some water out and take it to the master of the banquet. And then it, they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from. So he hadn't noticed that it ran out. He didn't know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, then the cheaper wine, after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs 
through which he revealed his glory, his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum uh, with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they started, they stayed for a few days. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for bringing us here this morning. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to draw near to you, that we have to come together uh, and, and to listen and to learn from you. God, help us to, to put all of the distractions away, to put everything aside, even for us as for the moms to just focus on your words in this moment and the message that you have for them, the message that you have for the men in this room, the message you have for us as the church. God, help us to focus on what you want to teach us this morning through this scripture and through the other scriptures that we're going to share together. God, I thank you for the opportunity again for us to come together to celebrate you, to worship you, uh, to thank you for all you've done in our lives, and to thank you for the gifts that you give us, especially the moms in this room today. Father, we thank you for our moms. We thank you uh, for the opportunity that we have to serve them and to celebrate them. Uh, Father, I just pray that you continue to use us, that our love and we honor our moms and, and uh, help us to understand that this morning. Uh, Father, we praise you. As soon as sons let me pray. Amen. All right. Um, so verse 1 and 2, we see what? There's a wedding taking place, right? So we have this wedding going on. It's wedding day. And Jesus' mom's there. Uh, the, the disciples are there. Jesus are there. Jesus, Jesus is there. So all of these guys are invited to the wedding, and they're at this wedding. And, uh, and at weddings, moms usually a lot of times shine at weddings, right? Uh, I've been doing weddings for a long time. Moms have a tendency to shine at weddings. Um, they have the ability to multitask at weddings. Moms have been gifted with that, the ability to multitask and to organize. You know, dads are the ones that are told what to do, right, by the moms. Moms are like, they do the muscle work, right, set up stuff. And the moms are around telling them, get this ready, get that ready, do this and do that. But moms get it done on wedding day, right? They make sure things are ready for the marriage, for the wedding. And uh, when ministers are doing weddings, when we're doing weddings, this is a text that we often use at a wedding. We talk about that Jesus blessed marriage by his presence and his first miracle at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. And we use that line to show that Jesus blessed, that he blessed weddings and marriages, and that he, that he honors that. And weddings and marriages are a big deal to God. Weddings and marriages are a big deal to God. Jesus talked about marriages and weddings oftentimes when he was talking about his relationship between him and the church. He would use the picture of marriages, the celebration of weddings, as part of that description. Um, and then Jesus' Jewish customs made weddings a big deal. I mean, weddings were a big deal in that culture, in the Jewish culture. I mean, they, they weren't just a one day, a few hour thing like it is here, right? I mean, weddings in that day were seven days of celebration. Seven days of celebrating the union between the groom and the bride. It was a big deal, a big celebration. And then in verse 3, in verse 3, at this big wedding is a big disaster moment. There's this big disaster moment. They run out of what? Wine, right? They run out of wine. And this is the groom and the groom's family's responsibility to make sure that there's plenty of wine for the, for the celebration, for this week-long celebration. They're responsible for, responsible for this. And again, it is a big deal in their culture. And it's very bad, very, very bad that they run out. I mean, this, by running out of wine at the wedding, is going to cause dishonor, dishonor on the groom, dishonor on the groom's family. So this was, this was really bad in this moment. So again, moms get things done, right? Whose mom's there? Jesus' mom. What better mom to have at the wedding, right, when there's a disaster going on, right? And so Jesus' mom, so in order to fix the problem and to not let the groom and his family look bad, Jesus' mom turns to Jesus, and she knows exactly what he can do. She knows exactly who he is, right, because we know the Christmas story. Right? In the Christmas story, when the, the shepherds came, when, when the prophets came and they, they honored Jesus, it says that she pondered those things in her heart. Right, 
And she knew when Jesus said, when the angel said to, to Mary that he was going to be the savior of the world, she remembered that. And she goes, this groom needs saving right now, right? He needs rescuing in this moment. So she turns to Jesus and, and gives him uh, some direction. Can you please make more wine? So Jesus responds. Jesus responds, not mother, but woman, right? Woman. Now, the, the Greek word here is gune. That's the Greek word that he says. And gune is not a term of disrespect. Actually, gune is a term of respect. It's like saying ma'am. And it's, an, it's a word of respect. Again, he doesn't say mother. He says woman, ma'am. Now, Jesus' response takes this story to a much deeper level, actually a deeper level than we're going to go in the story this morning but it's going to get us to where we need to go, to the lesson I believe God wants to teach us about the value of women this morning. So here's the first thing. We have to understand Jesus is not a teenager in this moment. He's a grown man in this moment. He's, he's 30 years old. His ministry is beginning. Luke uh, 3.23 tells us that, that Jesus was 30 years old when he began his ministry, and he is beginning his ministry in this moment. And that leads to the second thing. Jesus is beginning in his ministry, and the relationship between him and his mother has to change. It must change. There's a change in this relationship between him and Mary. Jesus is making it clear to Mary that she should no longer treat him as her son under, his, under her roof, but as the Messiah, as the Messiah, her Savior and Lord. You know, Jesus is her Savior and Lord, and that she needs to understand that, and that he is fulfilling the will of the Father, his Father, that he has a mission that he is a part of. And that relationship between him and Mary has to change. Mary is special. She is a special woman, but she is just a woman like all other woman, women, and I'm going to make Catholics mad, right? Because she is just a woman as all other women. And she needs to submit to Jesus as her Lord and her Savior, like everyone else. And she needs to understand that. And this relationship has to change. Now, her and her family, I mean, it's not just, I mean, Jesus has a mom, an earthly mom. He has earthly, he has actually four brothers, four earthly brothers. And it says that he has sisters. I mean, and none of them get a special treatment. None of them get a special pass. They all need Jesus to be their Savior. And they need to submit to them, to him as their Lord. And even though the angel did say that Mary was favored, I mean, he said that. And God chose Mary to give birth to the Messiah. And then Elizabeth said that she was blessed because she carried the Messiah. And then Mary said in her own song afterwards that I am blessed to be able to carry the Messiah but she also said in that same song that God is her savior, right? That she needed saving. Mary doesn't have any special privileges. Just like all of us, Romans 3.23, Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, all but Jesus. He is the only one that hasn't sinned. All of us fall short of his glory. And in this moment, Jesus' glory is going to shine. Now, Jesus also makes it clear in Luke chapter 11, verses 27 through 28. It says this, As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you, right? But Jesus replies, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And then in another moment, in Mark, Mark chapter 3, Jesus, the crowd is becoming violent. Jesus is getting closer to the cross, and, and the, the crowd is becoming, you know, they wanted to hurt Jesus. And so like any other mother, she wants to protect her son, right? And so it says that concern for his safety uh, Mary and his brothers go to Jesus and they begin to tell people he's out of his mind. They begin to say that. And he's crazy. And so uh, that's in Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. And then in Mark chapter 3, 
verse 31 through 35, when they show up the house where Jesus is teaching, he says this. It says, then Jesus' mothers and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And Jesus responds, who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in the circle around him and said, here are my, mothers, are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. Because it's about God's mission, God's will. And this relationship between Jesus and Mary has to change. See, it's not about what Mary wants, Mary's will. But Jesus says, I'm about my Father's will, my Father's message. And Jesus' words at this wedding are intentionally uh, chosen to reveal a radical allegiance change from his, uh, his mother's will to his Father's will. And there's this change of mission. And that leads to the third thing here. By Jesus' response and calling his mother, woman, ma'am, and again, he does it respectfully, but he's saying you're, you're, uh, he's saying you're stepping over a line that you're not meant to step over. You're stepping over this line. This isn't your place to call out my power. Now, this is a bigger picture. There is a bigger picture going on here, Mom. There's a bigger picture that we're preparing for. It's about saving lives eternally. And, and, and he goes, there's a bigger wedding banquet that I am preparing for. A bigger wedding banquet where we will not run out of wine. That, you know, there's this bigger wedding that I am preparing us for. Fulfilling the Father's will, the mission that he gave me. And he says, my hour has not yet come. And so this allegiance change, as we see this taking place in this moment, that's what's happening here. Yet... He will do what his mother says, right? He does obey her. He does do what she says. And he will make a moment with his first sign. He's going to take advantage of this moment for his glory. This is for his glory. That's what it says in the text. This is for his glory, not his mother's glory, but for his glory, for the father that he's doing it. But this will be done by obeying the father. And he is willing, he's willing to obey his father's words. And that's what he's doing in this moment. He is obeying his father. He's honoring his father. He's obeying and doing what it says, just like the text that we look at, right? Exodus chapter 20, he's fulfilling and honoring this scripture. Part of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and your mother, it says. Honor your father and your mother. It doesn't just say honor your father, does it? It says honor your father and Honor your mother also. You value your mother. So why? Why does it say this? It's because God values women. God values women and he values mothers. He values women. He values mothers. God says honor both, your father and your mother. Now, in, this is God's culture. Church, you've got to understand that. This is the way that it's supposed to be. This is the way that it's supposed to be in God's kingdom. But here's the thing is, you got God's culture versus the world's culture. And we, we are in two cultures. Guys, we are in the culture of the kingdom. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a part of God's kingdom, his culture. He sets the rules and the place and the culture. And then you got a worldly culture out there that is so broken and so confused and so lost and needing God. And needing to be rescued. But see, here's what happens. Other cultures influenced Israel. That's why God said not to intermarry with other cultures and other, other uh, nations around them. Because their culture, their beliefs can impact you. Can impact. And it did. It impacted Israel. It changed Israel. And we have to understand that there was a change in the treatment of women. God never, ever devalued women in Scripture. It never meant that. But in the cultures back then especially in the Greek culture. When, they, when, when Greek was in the superpower that it was, it began to influence the culture that was going on. And, and the Greeks influenced the culture of Israel and the culture of what was going on. And when they did that, the devaluing of women even became greater. And that culture began to influence Israel, began to come into how they treated women um, in that culture. 
and an influence. And God says, this is not the culture that is here with me. This is not how we treat each other. This is not how we treat women. This is, this is not the culture that I have. And so we have to understand God values women in his kingdom. We have to, it's in here. God values women. When God made man, what did he say was not good? He said it was not good for man to be alone, right? That was Genesis 2.18. He says it's not good for man to be alone. So man was by himself, and he says this is not good. He needs a helper. And, and so he created woman to help him. In their image, it says, right? It says he created man and women in the image of God they were created. And if man is created in the image of God, and it says woman is created, created in the image of God, when we devalue women, what are we saying to God? Right? Because woman was created in the image of God just as man was created in the image of God. And she was created for man to help him. Not to be controlled, but to help. And Genesis chapter 2, verses 22 to 24 talks about that. It talks about that women was, that God created woman and, and when he created woman, he created, him, created her from his rib, out of his side, to help man. And, and they become one, it says. And in that moment, in that scripture, it talks about that when God created woman, he created marriage. He created community. He created a family. And he honored that. And, and the two, these two, man and woman, when they're united, they become one flesh. They become one. And they work together as one, as a team, valuing both. He created marriage, and Jesus supported marriage, right, by his presence and first miracle at the wedding of Cana. He talk, I mean, he's there because he values marriage. He values the wedding. He values that moment. And also God created family. God created family. And he, so, so God saw the value of women to help man, one flesh, working together. And then when that was done, he said that was good. It was finished in that point, and it was good. And Jesus honors his father and mother, and he sets the example for us to follow. So kids, whether you're young and you're in high school, junior high, elementary school, or kids, if you're 50 or 60, right, you still honor your mom, right? You honor your mother. You value your moms. doesn't matter how old you are. You value your moms. If she is a believer or even if she's not a believer, you value your mom. You honor your mom. And hopefully if your mom's not a believer and you're living according to God's word and God's kingdom, you'll lead her to Christ. Right? You'll lead her to Christ and help her to be a believer. So we honor our moms. Proverbs 23, 22 through 25 says this. It says, listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. <laughs> yeah. By the truth. I love this line. By the truth. And he's talking about when they're teaching you the truth, buy it. Dig into it. Own it, right? Buy the truth and do not sell it. Wisdom, instruction, and insight as well. Understand that. Learn from your believing, God-leading family, your mom and dad. And we're talking about believing, God-honoring. The father of a righteous child has great joy. A man who fathers a wise son rejoices in him. May your father and mother rejoice. May she who gave you birth, listen to that, right? We hear that sometimes from, I gave you birth, right? I carried you. Right? It says, for one that she gave you birth, be joyful. That she be joyful because you're honoring her. Right? We honor our moms. We honor women. For moms, Scripture talks about your role as well as a teacher, as an example, as a comforter, as being compassionate, as being faithful, being a servant, being a protector, being joyful and bringing joy into the home being an encourager, and being a discipliner, and bringing love. Scripture talks about that. I gave you in your handouts, in your, in your programs, is a list of Scripture verses that talk about that. That's your role as mom. God calls you to, to do that and to live that out in your home. Husbands, 
All right, guys, here we go, right? Husbands, you are, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. You are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. We need to hear that. We need to understand that. You are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. I'm going to read Ephesians 21 through 33. And I know this is used as a, it's abused. But we need to understand and understand this well. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another, both of you. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For, your hus- for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And this is what's abused. Men have used this text to abuse their role. And it needs to stop. You need to stop twisting this verse. Because it goes on to the next verse. And it says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That sounds like value, doesn't it? That sounds like honoring. And we need to understand that. To make her holy and cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Men, leading your homes in a godly way is so important. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become what? One flesh. So he goes back to the beginning, Paul does, right? Become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. That sounds like valuing, right? And the church is called the bride of Christ. That's what the church is called. And that's a form of woman, right? So when Jesus loves the church, and he loves the bride, uh, that, she is a form. The church takes the form of a woman. And Jesus is the groom. And he loves the church. He honors the church. He values the church. He gives his life for the church. And we see that in his actions. And Jesus the Son and God the Father show their value for the church, for the bride, for who? Women, right? Jesus and the Father show their value for women, their love for women. Jesus values women. Jesus values women. Jesus always honored and respected women, and they played a role in his ministry and the building of the church. Um, Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Uh, it says, after this, Jesus uh, traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. This is the culture. This is the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. So the disciples were with him. And also some women who had been, uh, who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been cast out. Uh, Joanna, the wife of Chusa. Uh, the manager of Herod's household, Suzanne, uh, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means, out of their own means. So these women were, were with Jesus, traveling with Jesus, supporting in his ministry, out of their own means, out of their own money, out of their own funding. They were supporting the ministry of Jesus and the disciples. In John chapter 19, verses 26 to 27, Jesus fulfills his role as the oldest son, to care for his mom and to honor her. Uh, it says, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved, the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, again, here is your son. Here is your son. 
And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his house. And he fulfilled his role, honoring his mother, caring for his mother, doing what he was supposed to do. It doesn't say that Mary became the mother of all believers. Nowhere in scripture does it say that, but that she needed to be cared for. She needed to be cared for because of the culture. You know, women needed to be cared for in that culture. And Jesus took on his role and, and honored his mom. In God's word, in, in the kingdom, God shows the value of women and their impact, women's impact and their importance to the church and to the community and to their home. They have an important role in all of it. So here it is to the men in this room. To the men, in, in, and I want to cast this challenge to you. You must value and honor the women in your lives. We must value and honor the women in our lives as God has. And set the example for others, right? We have to set the example for others. We have to set men, husbands, fathers. You have to set the example for your kids. Your daughters need to know that they need to be honored and not to be abused by anybody, that they're valuable, right? And your sons need to know that they need to value the women in their life. They need to value their mother. They need to value their future bride, their future wife, and to value women. They need to see that. And men, we set the example. You must set the example and value the women in your lives because God commands you to. You have to value women. And honor them just as Jesus did. Now, women, in Proverbs 31, it's a beautiful proverb, and we're going to read this proverb. You know, what it looks like to be a godly woman and the impact a godly woman has. And so let's, uh, let's read this verse together. Proverbs chapter 31. A wife of noble character, who can find? She was worth far more than rubies. There's some value, right? Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and, and buys it out of her earnings and she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. She sees that her uh, trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the, uh, she holds the distaff and, and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respectable at the city gate, where he takes his seat among elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants uh, with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gates. Right? Women, you are important. You are valued. And God holds you in value. And you make an impact. And that last verse was like the exclamation point of the wisdom sayings of Proverbs. That's how it ended. You're valued. And I want to say one last thing. I want to close with this to those who do not know Jesus as your example. I'm going to go back to the wedding that we started with. He did what his mom asked him to do, right? He finished and he did it. Now, it's easy to make Jesus known when there's a celebration. It was easy for Mary to make Jesus known at the celebration. 
But it was much harder for her to make Jesus known when it was violent. What did she want to do? She wanted to save him. She wanted to rescue him. And he says, my hour has not yet come. I have work to do. I have a mission that I'm a part of. And church, and, and those of you that don't know Jesus, you are his mission. Jesus came to save us. And he stood in the face of violence. Jesus stood in the face of violence to take our place, to purify us by giving his life in our place. Where we should have paid the price for our sins, for our rebellion. He took our place and he paid the price for us, for you. He did that. And he shed his blood for ours. He let his blood be shed for ours. And what happens in this moment, this is not about his mom's glory. This, this moment is about his glory. And so he takes these jugs that were meant for ceremonial washing, for purifying. And he has these jugs filled with water. And he turns this water into wine. And wine represents Jesus' blood. When we take communion every week, we drink we take the bread and we take the wine. And that wine represents his blood that he shed for us to make us clean. To make us clean. And this moment, again, is a picture of his glory. What he does for you, what he does for us. And he's saying to the world, in this moment, there's another wedding day coming. And if you believe in me, if you trust in me, if you accept me as your Lord, as your Savior, as your, sa as your Messiah... And you will come to a banquet, a wedding banquet, and we will celebrate together in the kingdom of heaven. I came to save you, if you believe in that. And he closes, 1 John, 1 John. John, again, John 2 is about a wedding, and John talks again about this cleansing. And this is what it says. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, if we admit that we are wrong and he is right, he is faithful and just and he will forgive us all our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And that's what he does. He purifies us. He saves us through his blood. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made so that we could be made pure, so that we could be made right before the Father and be saved. God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus and the, and the, and the gift of this salvation in this moment. Above everything else, it's about you. It's about your glory. It's about your mission. It's about you saving us, and we thank you for that, and we honor you this morning. And we honor you by obeying. Father, help us to obey. Help us to, to follow you, not just to say, I, I'm, I'm choosing to, to change, but to truly walk with you and to live in your kingdom and to be faithful as you were faithful to us. God, help us to have the strength and the honor and the courage and the boldness to do that, to honor you by honoring women, by honoring you and, and honoring people and loving people and sharing the good news about what you've done. Father, we are blessed. We are all blessed because of you and because of your son, Jesus. In his name we pray and all God's people say, amen. All right. Server's going to pass the trays and a couple songs. And, and uh, we just ask that you take a, a piece of, take the, the, the bread and the juice are together in one cup. Take both cups out. Hold on to that. And then after a couple songs, Gary's going to come up and lead us in uh, uh, taking communion together to remember what Jesus did and to celebrate that. So let's uh, go ahead and stay seated. We're going to sing this song. And then after, after communion's all done, we can stand and continue to worship. <laughs> Actually, we're, let's just stand up. We'll do it all. <laughs> but before, before we sing this next song, I wanted to read the most famous verse of all time, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world... He gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the fact that God loved you 
enough to make a way to be with you forever, for all eternity, is an act that deserves our absolute worship, forever, for all eternity. So let's start right now in his house, in his presence, among his people. Let's give him our best as we sing this song.
world has known many kings. The world has known many cruel kings, many merciful kings, proud kings, and humble kings, powerful kings, weak and cowardly kings. But the world has never known a king like our king, Jesus. darkness we were away without hope without light till from heaven you came on there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake
so I'm not singing. <laughs> to go off script for just a second. My mother died about a year and a half ago, uh, just a few days before her 91st birthday. I will see her again. I will hold her. She will hold me because I baptized her myself into the faith at age 70. Yeah, praise God. That's something of true value. Okay. Jesus... Judas of Scar Bleh. Okay, I'm going to try and talk now. <laughs> Judas Iscariot, not a name you hear often in communion meditations. But I think if you know someone would have told him a year and a half before he did what he did, what he was going to do, I think he would have probably said they were crazy. So how does he go from performing miracles in God's name? to selling Jesus out for a handful of silver. Well, I think I know how, because it's happened to me in the past. I think he started with just a little slip. He was in charge of the funds of the group, and I think he just took a little silver off the top, and nobody noticed, and thus begins the slow slide into destruction. Okay. But if you look at the crucifixion, they all failed Jesus on that night. They all scattered. They all ran. It's believed that Mark was the one that had to end run away naked because he lost his robe. Uh, Peter denied Christ three times. And they all scattered. And after the crucifixion, they all had burdens to bear. I think there was a lot of... Uh, heartfelt, deep, passionate prayers, a lot of regret, a lot of remorse. But all of them were restored. Jesus had to go to Peter's fishing boat because he ran that far. And on a lakeside over some cooked fish, Jesus said, do you love me, Peter? said, God, you know I do. And he was restored. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what sins you may be carrying. Be they large or be they small. This is the time to, to repent, to lay him down and to come to the cross. To recognize what Jesus did for you and for me. And to repent, and in this morning, at this time, you can have joy. You can have joy, and you can have peace, and you can know that you're going to be in heaven with me and my mom and my wife. It's going to be great. So, in the upper room, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks it and he said take this all of you and eat it this is my body that will be shed for you that will be broken for you then he took the wine again he gave thanks and praise and he said take this all of you and drink it this is my blood the blood of a new covenant that will be shed for you and for all men so that your sins may be forgiven. And do this in memory of me. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you, Jesus, for your work on the cross. I thank you that it applies to my life. I give you all my thanks and praise. And God, I ask that you bless all the mothers in this room as well as all of us, but the mothers especially, because I've lived long enough to see what they go through, and they deserve it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks, Gary. That was terrific. 
you guys can, we're going to stand for one more song. It's been a powerful morning. We want to leave you with a blessing straight from Scripture. Number 6, 24 through 26 says this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. We would like to sing that over you before we go home today.
keep you, make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you, Lord, turn his face toward you, and give you peace. Amen. Father, we thank you for another week in your house. We thank you for a powerful message and a reminder. We thank you just for the opportunity to come and worship you as a family. Pray that you will take everything that we offered this morning as just true heartfelt worship. And I pray for this blessing over all of the families and all the people in this room. And I just pray that it is a blessing to them to know that you are for us and that you go before us and that you are behind us and within us and beside us all the time. We cannot go too far. anyone in this room who needs Jesus. 